so much for joining me today for a brief talk about advocacy. We're going to talk about how you can be the voice for your child. My name is Andrea Cedar, and I am a developmental consultant with Surrey Place. Today, we're going to talk about the key principles of being an advocate. We're going to look at some real life examples of what can happen when you're with a doctor, with family that might pose as a challenge or a struggle to be the real voice for your child. And then we're going to look at the key takeaways. What are we going to do next? How can you access some supports in the community? So when I think about an advocate, I think of some of these following words. I think of being a leader. I think of being educated. I think of support to your child. I think of a willingness to learn about yourself, about your child, about the community and, and the supports that are in it. And we think about working together as part of your child's whole team. Sometimes that team is big, sometimes it's just you. And that's okay, that's your team. So let's break down all of those words that we just looked at on the previous slide. If you do want to know more about this topic and about the work that has been done and research that's been done on being an advocate, you can look at Ariva Martin's work in the book called The Everyday Advocate. So let's go to being a leader. As an advocate, you need to be a leader. You need to be able to take action and know when we can sit back and listen and think, okay, things are good, or when we need to initiate change, when we need to be the ones that say, I want something done right now. We really want to take on that commitment and harness that commitment that you have for your child and really use it to be the leader in your child's life. When we think about learning, we want you to be an expert, but we want you to be an expert in everything that has to do with your child. We don't need you to be an expert in medicine or behavior. We need you to know your child best, and you do. You're their parent, right? So some of the ways that you can enhance that knowledge that you have of your child already is to knowing some of the facts that you can um, you can document that you can bring out at meetings with professionals and, and you can say, but this is what I know. So sometimes we look at the dev developmental milestones. So those are the skills that we know are developing at a certain age in their development. Sometimes when we're doing their developmental milestones or looking up and, and um, surveying their developmental milestones, we see red flags, we know that there's delays in certain areas of their development. So we might want to put together a whole list of all of your child's needs, red flags, kinds of areas of concern, but also we cannot forget about all of their strengths, what they're interested in, what they like to do, how they spend their time. So doctors and professionals, they need to know both. They need to see where they're excelling, where they're growing, how they're developing, and also the areas in where they need a little bit more support. If you want to know a little bit more information on child development, on the developmental milestones, so you can know if there are any red flags with their development, there is a YouTube video on the Surrey Place website called Child Development. So check that one out. So one of the parts about being an advocate is the ability to think critically. And that's a really tricky skill to have, especially when it comes to your child. You want the best for your child. You are all in to support and to advocate for them. And part of thinking critically sometimes involves taking a step back and reflecting and thinking about things before you go ahead and say yes, no, or, or make certain decisions. Okay, so if somebody is recommending a certain therapy or a certain program, you can ask for time to think about it before making the decision. You can say, 
can you tell me more before I decide? It's really important to do that instead of having to then go back on all of the decisions that you make because you then think about it after you've made the decision and then go, but wait a minute, I don't know enough about it or I think I spoke too soon. So ask for time. It can be five minutes, but it can be a day or two to really think about what it is that's being recommended and what makes sense for you and your family. You wanna know what your priorities are. Right. So different professionals are going to have different priorities. And so when we've made our list of strengths and needs, we know out of all of that list of needs, what makes the most sense for you to start working on with your child and what what's most important for your family and and your um, your quality of life. So sometimes a doctor might focus on something and it might not be along the same lines as your priority. Same with a specific therapist. Their focus is really going to be on their specific trade and practice. So you want to recognize that that's, that's where they're coming from, but it might not align with your priorities. So you want to speak with power and authority about the things that you want to focus on, okay? To be a critical thinker, you also need to be able to listen. One thing that we have to really kind of be careful of is that we're not thinking of the next thing we're going to say while we're being um, informed on, on information, on, on things that we're, we're learning about. You're, you might miss some really key information if you're planning and thinking about other things and you're not actively listening to what is being said to you. Okay. If you're a list maker like me, you might want to make a list of all of the pros and all of the cons of a specific service or recommendation that's being made. That's part of being a critical thinker. Going back to knowing what your priorities are, you want to consider what the source is and where the information is coming from, what their background is, what their experiences are. Sometimes the source is a family member, you know, who also has a child who has some red flags in their development. So you want to consider what their lived experience is with their own child. Um, and same with other professionals. You have to recognize that the, the physicians, pediatricians, therapists are going to have a different understanding and background that is going to push those recommendations. Okay. Remember that it is absolutely okay to ask questions, to ask, why are you recommending this? Ask for examples of other families who you've recommended this for. Ask, how long is this for? What Can I have a timeline, an estimated timeline of what, what you think this is going to go on for? You can say, I don't understand. Can you please tell me in a different way? So ask questions along the way. Okay, another really important part about being an advocate is being prepared, documenting things, being organized. And I could list off ways that I've done it, but it's going to have to work for you and your family. So you want to create a system, whether that is handwritten notes, whether that's a file folder system, whether that is digital, whether that is um, with a professional who is documenting everything, think about a way that you can keep everything organized and keep all the documents in one place. Sometimes taking pictures of things is really helpful. So you could take pictures of reports that you've gotten, um, take videos of your child doing the things that you want to question or you want to have observed of a professional or a doctor, okay? And start to do this as early as possible, okay? Before the appointment happens, review the information that you have, make sure that you have any kind of assessment reports or um, any kind of notes from other professionals to bring along with you to any of the appointments, okay? As much as you can, get everything in writing. So you could ask for a quick summary. Maybe a professional could send you an email afterwards. Maybe you could take a picture of, of the information that they were writing down um, so that you were, um, you're able to, to keep all of that information in the right place. Okay. 
you can always then go back, look over your notes, and then move forward with the next step. Going back to being um, being critical and being a critical thinker, you're reflecting on the information. Okay, you want to be able to tell people who weren't there for the 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 meetings what information were the key takeaways of that meeting. To collaborate, to work with other people is a really big part of being an advocate. Sometimes families and children have a really big team, right? They might have lots of different family members that are involved in their care. Um, there might be neighbors, there might be uh, community members, there might be um, staff at the library, there could be professionals, doctors, therapists, public health nurses, right? So all of these people are part of your child's team. And so again, it can be a big team, it could have one of everybody that I just mentioned, or it could just be you and a public health nurse, right? And either way, that's a valuable team to have, right? You want to approach all of these people, especially the professionals with confidence. Again, you know your child best. You are their biggest advocate. You are their biggest voice, okay? You want to create respectful relationships, right? So when you are confident in what you know about your child, they will respond with, hmm, this one knows their stuff. So let's really work together and collaborate so that everything works in the favor of the child, okay? You want to be productive. You wanna make a contribution in any of the meetings and any of the, um, the sessions, and sometimes that's just asking questions, right? Sometimes that's just going, can I just clarify a little bit more? But share information, take part in the d discussions, and be ready to follow through. That's a big one too, right? It's, it's not just asking questions and being there, but also following through with the recommendations. It shows that you're engaged and you're committed to this work that, we're, that everybody is putting in. A big thing about uh, being a good collaborator is picking your battles, right? Sometimes it's not always worth it to really dig in. And sometimes it's too hard to follow through on all of the recommendations that are being made by one professional. So figure out what is achievable, what makes sense for you and your family right now, and, and go for it and really commit to those things, okay? You might need to anticipate conflict if, um, you know, if there's a lot of strong-willed people within um, a team but again, if it's a respectful relationship, then you can work through that. Okay, so now we're going to review a few scenarios that might come up within your work as an advocate for your child. And then let's work through them together. Let's figure out what's stopping you and how can you get over those, those little hurdles. Okay, sometimes what we might hear is, I think we should just wait and see. That could be a physician, it could be a community member, it could be a partner, another parent. Let's just wait and see. I think this is just a phase, right? What we do know is that early intervention, getting in there as soon as possible to support that skill development is the best route, okay? So you can say something like, I am concerned now. I would like another opinion, okay? Sometimes what we hear are these gender stereotypes. Oh, he's a boy. Boys take longer to toilet train. Boys develop slower, things like that. So you might hear some gender stereotypes. Um, again, you can go back. If this is a, a, a doctor saying these kinds of things, you can say, can you refer me to a pediatrician? So pediatricians are that next level of, um, of professionalism when it comes to child development and recognizing and understanding child development. <clears throat> okay. Sometimes we might hear, oh, she's just being lazy or she's being stubborn, right? Or it's just a phase, it'll pass. And at this point in time, we might say, you know what, I'd really like to review the developmental checklist that I've that I've completed. 
And again, that child development workshop on the Surrey Place YouTube channel will show you a couple of different standard checklists that you could complete and take with you to any appointment. You might hear some judgmental statements that are really not helpful. You need better parenting strategies. And this one you might want to say things like, can you help refer me to a home visitor program or an early intervention program, an infant development program? There's too many names for them, but any of those will work, right? Um, those programs we're going to review in a little bit. So it's not always what other people are saying to us that is getting in the way, but sometimes it's our own thoughts and our own feelings that are getting in the way of us moving forward. So let's go through some of those examples. So sometimes we might be thinking, well, my uncle, my brother, my cousin, they didn't start talking until they were five years old and now look at them, they're fine, right? So absolutely, we hear that a lot. What we do know is that there there definitely could be a genetic component in terms of your child's language development, but either way, if it is genetic or not, they can benefit from support and from intervention right now. Okay, so let's not wait. The other thing I often say to families if they're wondering about accessing a speech assessment, for example, is, well, let's, let's go through this. What if you put your child's name on the wait list for a speech therapy assessment and over the months while they're waiting, because there's often wait lists for a lot of these kinds of things, they get to the top of the wait list, they go to a speech assessment and they shine. They show off all of those amazing skills that they caught up on over the, the few months that they've been waiting. Great, no harm done, amazing. But what happens if we say, mm, you know what, I'm just gonna wait a couple months to see if that the, the, they catch up. And then at the end of those few months, they're still not catching up and could still do with a speech assessment. Now we're at the bottom of that wait list and we have to wait another couple of months to get to the top of that wait list. So no harm done if you've gone to a speech assessment and the therapist goes, amazing, you're doing so well, keep on doing what you're doing, no harm done, right? But if we're waiting and then we're waiting and we're waiting, that's really, really critical key time that you could be offering support to your child. Another thought that comes up often is it's my anxiety, it's my depression, I feel guilty. Those are the reasons why my child is behind in their development. And with this one, I think of two different kind of levels of support. We need the support for the child. If they are behind, um, we need to be able to support their child in, in meeting their milestones. And then the other level of support is we need to have something there for your parent, for, for the parent, right? So those feelings are getting in the way of, of being the best parent that you can be. So if you are feeling anxiety or depression or feelings of guilt, you might want to seek out your own support to kind of work through those feelings so that you can then pick up where you know you can be as a, as a good, strong advocate for your child. This is one that we hear a lot. Mm, maybe my child is confused because we speak multiple languages at home. So what we do know is that we want there to be consistency. We also really want that your child is exposed to their their home languages and their the languages that the members of their community and their families are going to be speaking. So as long as there is some consistency, at home I speak this language, at school I speak this language, there's going to be um, much greater success in your child understanding and learning and knowing what to anticipate in what environment. So sometimes we go, oh, my doctor's not going to believe me, right? So let's think about all of the other things that we've learned in this brief session, right? We want to be documenting things. We want to be prepared. We want to be ready. We could bring somebody with us to the appointments. We want to ask questions, right? Take videos. So do all of those things that we've talked about, about being a strong advocate. And if all else fails, go and see another doctor if this one doesn't believe you. Okay. 
Maybe I'm just being overproductive. Maybe I'm overthinking this. Maybe this is a me thing, right? Let's go back to our developmental checklists and feel validated. If you're not seeing a skill when you can see in the developmental checklist that, yep, this should be happening at this point in time, I should ask for support. I should seek out help, okay? So when we're in doubt, let's go back to the things that we know. We want to know as much as we can about our child's development. So you can complete different checklists, the look-see checklist, which is a child development one, or the communication checklist, which is a speech and language one. If your child isn't meeting their milestones, seek out that support early. Um, if you have a, a younger child, the doctor should be completing an 18 month well baby visit at the 18 month checkup and they should be completing one of these checklists. So we want to catch things early and get them into the right services. You can talk to a friend, talk to somebody who you know who has been going through the same thing or who hasn't. And again, trust your gut. As a parent, you know your child best. There's different early intervention services in Ontario. These ones, uh, some of them are specific to Toronto. These are all links that you can access um, uh, to, to find out more about the different programs. There's infant and early childhood development programs where you are connected to an early interventionist and they will support you to learn the strategies to help your child develop during everyday routine activities. Early abilities is speech and language support. So there would be a full a speech and language assessment, and then if needed, speech, speech therapy. Healthy Babies, Healthy Children is run by um, Toronto Public Health. They are there to answer questions about babies, about um, your child's development, they often do in-home visits um, with the public health nurse, okay? And then our early ons are Ontario-based. They're a really fantastic social opportunity for children to gather, and also a great opportunity for parents to meet others in their own community, okay? Again, you can go back to the YouTube channel on Surrey Place's website and click on the child development video to see more about these services. Thank you so much for viewing this session on child advocacy. We hope you found it helpful. If you've enjoyed this then would, and would like to view some more of our other recorded events, please visit us at surreyplace.ca forward slash wellness. As always, we welcome your feedback. Please take a moment to tell us what you thought of this recorded event by visiting the link on your screen. We hope to see you again soon. Take care.